Good morning, everyone. I'm Dana Corson, a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for joining us this morning for a webinar on the report that was just released titled Guiding Principles for Developing Dietary Reference Intakes Based on Chronic Disease. You can now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nationalacademies.org forward slash DRI chronic disease. And you can follow the conversation about the report on social media at hashtag DRI chronic disease. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to, to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. The academies operate under a congressional charter to the National Academy of Sciences that was signed by President Lincoln in 1863. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have with me several members of the committee to discuss the report's findings and recommendations but before I introduce them, I would like to go over a few technical reminders. After the opening remarks, um, we will begin to take questions through the Q&A box located in the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type your question in the box at any time and click Submit. We ask that you leave the box set to send your questions to all panelists and that you please identify yourself and your organization or affiliation when asking questions. And if you have any technical issues during the webinar, please contact WebEx Technical Support. They are at 1-866-229-3239. And now I'd like to introduce the members of the committee who are here with us today. Um, we have Dr. Shariki Kumanyika, who's the chair of our committee. She is Professor Emerita of Epidemiology at the Perlman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania and Research Professor in the Department of Community Health and Prevention at the Dornsife School of Public Health at Drexel University. We also have Dr. Janet King, Professor Emerita at University of California, Berkeley and Davis, and Senior Scientist at Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute. We also have Dr. Marion Newhauser, full member in the can Cancer Prevention Program at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and core faculty in Nutritional Sciences and affiliate professor of epidemiology at the University of Washington. We also have Dr. Joseph Rodericks, who's the founding principal at Ramble Environ based in Arlington, Virginia. We'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by Dr. Kumanika, and then we will open it up to any questions you may have. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour unless we run out of questions beforehand. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Kumanika. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, we appreciate your uh, interest in our report and are delighted to be able to present the findings of what has been a very challenging process. I'll start by acknowledging our sponsors, uh, the several agencies, uh, including uh, Health Canada and several U.S. agencies who have been the sponsors of this report. Uh, the study focus is on methodology. We were asked to uh, develop a potential organizational process for developing dietary reference intakes based on the effects of nutrients or other food substances, uh, which we sometimes abbreviate as NOFS, on chronic diseases, and to develop guiding principles and recommendations for addressing conceptual and methodological challenges that would be encountered in such a process. 
The committee members are shown here. We had a very diverse committee in terms of expertise, including nutrition science, uh, methodology for evidence review, epidemiology, uh, and uh, risk assessment, toxicology. Uh, all of these topics were very relevant to the development uh, of this report. So the first three chapters of the report deal with the background needed to really understand the, the issues and recommendations that I'll talk about later and how the committee approached them. Uh, we needed to understand what the dietary reference intakes are, how they're developed now, how they're used by policymakers, risk managers, uh, and the public, and how a process focused on chronic diseases would be different from what has been done previously. And these are just some uh, copies of the existing DRI report. Uh, this slide illustrates the three main types of DRIs. Uh, you see across a level of intake from low to high. At the lower end, the risk of inadequacy is 50%. Um, at the level that's shown for the estimated um, average requirement. And the RDA, which is set higher, is a level at which the, the risk of inadequacy for that particular nutrient is nearly zero. It's about 2 to 3%. At the other end of intake, as you go up, there's an upper limit set for intake uh, above which risk of adverse effects increases. Um, in relationships that are, are not always the same and, and hard to define, but those levels are set for each specific nutrient. Examples of DRI uses are on this slide. Uh, for a lot of population level policy processes in terms of food labeling, fortification levels, and so forth, and also at, um, to support advice at the individual level in dietary guidelines and for clinical assessment. This slide explains really in a simplified way what we see as the difference between a traditional DRIs that have been developed to date and DRIs that are created expressly for the uh, purpose of reducing chronic disease risk. And this acknowledges that chronic disease data have been used previously in the development of DRIs, but uh, our task was to look at a process for developing DRIs to address chronic disease risk directly. So um, DRIs for essential nutrients are needed, these are traditional, because deficiencies will affect everyone if intake isn't adequate. Uh, they're caused by one nutrient, and they are prevented by interventions that provide that nutrient. It's very clear cut. Chronic disease DRIs are uh, not warranted uh, because they don't deal with the essentiality issue, they're not warranted unless sufficient evidence exists for a relationship because the risk to acquire CDs um, varies by individual and chronic diseases are often related to many different risk factors, including genetic and various environmental risk factors. And because nutritional interventions, uh, even on that particular nutrient or set of nutrients, will only partly ameliorate the risk of chronic diseases. A unique aspect of our uh, task was its basis in a report that we referred to as the options report. Uh, the citation is shown here. It's now published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And this report was developed as the nutrition community recognized the importance of really addressing chronic disease risk in the DRI process and, and the unique challenges that are posed methodologically by addressing chronic disease risk. So um, the core questions in this options report r related to um, issues of how you tell if there's a causal relationship, that's the first bullet, and then if you can tell that there is a causal relationship, um, what is the acceptable level of confidence in the data for the shape of that relationship between the um, level of intake and the disease response, and what are approaches for identifying and characterizing that relationship, uh, if, if appropriate, to recommend um, the DRIs. And three, what should be the organizational process for recommending chronic disease DRIs in light of the existing process? There are a lot of specific challenges that are addressed in our recommendations, which we'll 
cover later in the presentation, but these are the core issues, causal relationships, um, intake response, and the organizational process. So this is a methodological report. It does not deal with uh, DRI for any specific nutrient. But according to the statement of tasks, the committee was asked to assess the options presented in the report to determine guiding principles for inclusion of chronic disease endpoints uh, for food substances that would be used by the future DRI committees that are set up by the National Academies, and to provide justification for the options that we selected or did not select that served as the basis for the guiding principles. Um, and also to uh, address additional issues that were not considered in the options report, which was very thorough, but the door was left open for additional issues to be addressed. Uh, this is a, a representation of the process that's used to develop dietary reference intakes. It shows that the federal DRI steering committee, which is the government agency, representatives of government agencies in the U.S. and Canada, uh, initiate the process, identify the problem to be addressed, and solicit uh, an evidence review, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is shown here as the agency that has been um, managing the systematic review process, as you can see by that arrow. And the systematic review process is done by a, a team especially trained to do that kind of work and advised by a technical expert panel uh, during that process. The National Academy's role is to form the uh, DRI committee and manage the process of developing the DRIs. The committees um, receive that systematic review report, evaluate the evidence in that report, look at the overall totality of evidence, develop a report which goes to the federal users of the DRI values and others, and that's uh, called risk management in contrast to risk assessment, which is finding out where the risk is and then risk manages. How do you translate that into particular policy uses? So our approach was to clarify some initial definitions and, and concepts, review the options report, look at the challenges that the past GRI committees had encountered, especially where they had, had needed to use chronic disease data uh, review the current methods of conducting the systematic reviews of evidence and rating the quality, and we pay particular attention to the evidence where uh, nu nutrients or other food substances had been evaluated in relation to chronic diseases. And we reviewed the current methods of characterizing the intake response relationships, which is a big part. It relates to six of our recommendations. Among the initial clarifications, uh, population of interest for DRIs is the uh, apparently healthy population of the general population. And we clarified that uh, that population now includes people with chronic conditions. Uh, at least uh, half of the U.S. population has some type of chronic condition, so the population of interest was not a, a, a totally um, disease-free population in that sense, and we took that into account in making our recommendations. The definition of nutrients and other food substances, of course, was important, and it's shown here. And the um, essence is that we are referring to either nutrients that we know are essential or essential for some people, uh, energy nutrients, and other naturally occurring bioactive food components. So the naturally occurring is the key word. We were not looking at food additives. The nutrients or other food substances um, also refers to nutrients in any form, foods and supplements, but we made a distinction in terms of data that would be evaluated because with, uh, in a supplement you can really identify that particular nutrient directly if it's in food that's in a package with a lot of other things and it's less direct in terms of making a, a judgment about that particular nutrient. Uh, and the last, on this uh, slide, we recognized that there was limited experience in making quantitative associations between uh, NOFS and um, chronic diseases up to date, and that we would be um, in uh, uncharted territory to some extent. <laughs> Requirements to develop a DRI, three types of evidence, 
evidence that there is a causal relationship and a judgment about that evidence with a specified level of certainty so that we would go forward to developing the, looking at the quantitative data on the relationship between intake and risk of the disease. Uh, the specified level of certainty also applies there. And we need to then specify the range of intakes over which the chronic disease risk is reduced. Uh, that would be based on the above analyses and specified public health goals for risk reduction. Uh, the main challenges as we got into the task are listed here. Um, there are variations in the health effects of a nutrient or food substance depending on its chemical form and on how an individual digests it and makes the nutrient available in the body. Uh, we needed to determine nutrient intake with uh, the greatest accuracy possible or to guide committees on how to do that uh, to identify the contribution of a single nutrient in spite of its um, uh, action in the context of other variables that affect the chronic diseases. And the final challenge and a big challenge in the area of nutrition science, especially currently, is that we looked at the strengths and limitations of uh, the main two types of studies that are available, randomized controlled trials uh, and observational study designs or cohort studies to evaluate these associations. And both types have limitations and strengths for the purpose, and we had to consider what guidance to provide committees on um, using those types of, of studies. So now to the recommendations. Uh, the first two recommendations relate to measurement issues. They're in chapters four and five of the report. Uh, recommendation one relates to evaluation of dietary intake measures because the usual way of, of identifying the intake of a nutrient is through dietary reports, although there are um, biological measures that can be used as well. Recommendation is that until better intake assessment methodologies are developed in terms of dietary reports and applied widely, the DRI committee should strive to ensure that both random and systematic errors and biases uh, in the, of the nutrient or other food substance exposure assessment methodologies are considered in the evidence review. In the long term, the research agenda should really try to improve the assessment of, of dietary intake. The second recommendation relates to the um, measurement of outcomes and the specification of outcomes. Uh, the recommendation is that the ideal outcome is some measure of the chronic disease itself, the one we're interested in for that nutrient as defined by accepted diagnostic criteria including composite endpoints, which look at uh, more, more than one chronic disease at the same time. When that's applicable, uh, surrogate markers or proxies for that disease could be considered with the goal of using the findings as supportive information uh, to the results based on the chronic disease itself. Uh, noteworthy, to be considered, surrogate markers should meet certain qualification criteria. It can't be any uh, biological variable that's associated, that appears to be associated with the nutrient of the chronic disease. We specify in the report the criteria that would assure us that, the, uh, that using that surrogate is going to give you a, a uh, valid effect on the nutrient that, uh, and the disease that, um, that we could use to complement the evidence on the disease itself. Uh, chapter six talks about how you judge that a causal relationship is available. Um, DRIs would not be relevant if there's no causal relationship between the nu nutrient and the disease, and that's fairly obvious, but this is an important step, a very important step, and time-consuming <laughs> step. Uh, the recommendation is that the DRI committee should use the GRADE system in assessing the certainty of the evidence related to the causal association between nutrient or other food substances and chronic diseases. And GRADE is an acronym that's shown at the bottom of the slide. Uh, stands for Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. 
Uh, it's widely used, very transparent approach, uh, and there's a lot of detail about GRADE uh, on their website, but also in our report. Uh, we developed this recommendation for using the GRADE system because it is uh, similar to the other systems that have been used to evaluate uh, evidence, and we looked at several of them. They're shown in an appendix. But it's the most comprehensive, or the committee felt it's the most comprehensive, well-documented, and widely used. So using GRADE, then, the committee recommends that the decision to proceed to develop a chronic disease DRI is based on at least moderate certainty, uh, where the operative word there is moderate, that a causal relationship exists, and on the existence of an intake response relationship. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means on the next slide. Uh, the GRADE system has very well laid out criteria for deciding on certainty of evidence. And you can see at the top that randomized controlled trials start off with a high rating, uh, meaning they're considered to be a high quality study for internal validity for, for seeing that causal association until proven otherwise. And observational studies are at the other end, and they start with a low rating, primarily because in the observational studies you cannot rule out that you have a confounded, that, that the association you see is basically due to something else that you can't really control for as well as you could in a trial. Uh, the rating is modified downward from a high study if there are limitations, or from, a, from any kind of study if there are limitations, and these are well spelled out. Uh, in, in detail on specific criteria, and it's modified upward if there is found to be one of the three criteria shown on the right of the slide, a large magnitude of effect, um, a dose response, or that confounders, if adjusted for, would actually make the um, uh, association stronger rather than less likely to be there. So the final rating is high, moderate, or low, and what I said on the prior slide is that we have to have moderate, which means the randomized control trial has to retain its, its rating at least at that level, or an observational study would have to be moved up to that level, and we would have to see the dose response in any case. The rationale for recommending use of GRADE, I hinted at before. Uh, we laid out the criteria we thought would be appropriate for an appropriate evidence review tool, including the systematic review sort of guidance or requirements, which the DRI committee will not do. That's done by the systematic review team. But we, laid, we looked at those and we decided that GRADE met those criteria. It's in wide use, applicable, has very good vocabulary and definitions, and has criteria for assessing the strength of recommendations. So now to this issue of actually uh, recommending DRI levels. Uh, the next six recommendations that I'll go over relate to the intake response relationship. And this illustration just gives you a visual of what we're talking about when we refer to this intake response relationship. Uh, going across the level of intake from low to high, the RDAs and the ULs are already set. Uh, we're looking within the range that's considered safe and adequate to see how does the uh, risk of chronic disease change as intake increases or decreases. And so this particular curve is not necessarily the one we would see, but this is to show you that that's what we're talking about. What does that actual curve look like? Um, or line look like for the intake response. So recommendation four addresses the issue of selecting indicators for specifying intake response relationships. The committee recommends that the use of a, recommends the use of a single outcome indicator on the causal pathway. Um, however, if a single food substance reduces the risk of more than one chronic disease, then reference values could be developed for each chronic disease. And this responds directly to options that are spelled out in the options report and are discussed in, in the text in um, Chapter 7. Uh, the next question is, when should intake response data be extrapolated? Meaning, uh, if the data you have are based on a specific population or set of populations, when can you apply the information you get from that to a population other than those populations. And so the committee recommends extrapolation of the intake response data 
uh, only to populations that are similar to the study populations in the underlying factors related to the chronic disease of interest, uh, and not necessarily to populations where you're not sure of that similarity and that you would carry over the intake response relationship. Recommendation six, uh, six and seven actually both relate to the different types of DRIs. So the current types of DRIs are the EARs and the RDAs and, and the ULs. Uh, the recommendation uh, six in response to a question posed in the options report is that DRIs for chronic disease risk should take the form of a range rather than a single number. That relationships should be defined as different ranges of the intake response relationship where risk is at minimum is decreasing and or is increasing uh, as defined from the, determined from the slope as zero, negative, or positive. So picture that graph that was on the, um, the section title slide. Uh, when a nutrient or other food substance reduces the risk of more than one chronic disease, DRIs could be developed for each chronic disease even if the confidence levels for each chronic disease are different. Recommendation seven, um, addresses the issue of types of DRIs in specific relation to the upper limits, the tolerable uh, upper up intake limits that are set traditionally now on, the, on toxicity endpoints. The committee recommends retaining the ULs um, based on the traditional toxicity endpoints. Endpoint. So we didn't recommend the process of replacing those ULs. In addition, uh, we noted that if the increased intake of a substance has been shown to increase the risk of a chronic disease, such a relationship should be characterized as the range where decreased intake is beneficial. So if it increases risk, you would want to uh, have a range where it's a good idea to lower the intake. If the increase in risk occurs only above the UL, uh, no chronic disease DRI would be required because avoiding intakes greater than the UL will avoid the chronic disease risk. That's sort of stating the obvious, but we just wanted to make it clear that if you're already above the UL, then you don't need to specify further. Uh, the acceptable levels of confidence in the intake response data uh, were queried by the options report uh, in the same way that they were, uh, that the acceptable level of confidence was queried for the causal association itself. And the committee uh, recommended that developed a chronic disease DRI, the level of certainty in the intake response relationship should generally be the same as the level of certainty for the determination of causality. That is, at least moderate using the grade uh, approach. However, in some cases, for example, if the food substance increases chronic disease risk, the level of certainty con considered acceptable might be lower uh, in, in the context of increased risk. In all cases, a thorough description of the scientific uncertainties is essential in describing quantitative intake response relationship. And I think this is a theme throughout the report, description, documentation, um, where there's always going to be uncertainty, I think that's clear from some of the things I showed before about assessing uh, nutrient intakes, for example. But, but it has to be described uh, along with uh, um, the rationale for making a particular judgment so that others can see that, and that's in one of the guiding principles. Recommendation nine, of what approaches can be taken to make decisions if the benefits and harms overlap? So recommendation nine is that, if possible, health risk benefit analysis should be conducted and the method to characterize and decide on this risk benefit balance should be made explicit and transparent. The decision needs to consider the certainty of evidence for harms and benefits, changing intake, and be based on clearly articulated public health goals. If the DRI committees do not perform such risk benefit analyses themselves, because they, the risk benefit analysis in this case is in the purview of the risk managers and policymakers, it's still necessary in the DRI report to describe the disease outcomes, their severities, the magnitudes of risk increases and decreases over the various ranges of intake and other factors that would allow users to make informed decisions. 
Um, chapter 8 relates to the actual process of integrating the, the chronic disease DRIs into the current process. And the two recommendations, the last two, uh, recommendation 10 is about the organizational process. Uh, and the committee recommended that because of the need for close coordination and exchange of ideas when setting DRIs based on the indicators of adequacy and toxicity on the one hand and chronic disease on the other, one single uh, National Academy's parent committee should develop the DRIs for the prevention of nutrient deficiencies and toxicities and for reducing the risk of chronic disease. Uh, however, we did note that um, the, there's a different type of expertise uh, and different issues that arise in uh, determining adequacy, toxicity versus chronic disease. And so therefore, this, the parent committee may very well decide to create two subcommittees that would have different expertise, develop these different types of DRIs, and then bring the information together. Recommendation 11, what should be the starting point for chronic disease DRIs? And the, the uh, committee responded to that option, the options posed by suggesting that when there's sufficient evidence to develop a chronic disease DRI for one or more nutrient or other food substances that are interrelated in their chronic, um, uh, uh, one or more substances inter interrelated in their causal relationships with one or more chronic diseases, a committee should be convened to review the evidence of their association with all selected diseases. So that starting point is if you have enough evidence for one or for a set, in relation to a disease, um, then you should review all the disease associations with all of the diseases. The last uh, two slides are on the guiding principles we developed. We have these at the end because they really reflect the, uh, the thoughts and issues and recommendations that uh, have been covered in these uh, in the previous slides. And there are uh, 14 of these, the first seven relate to the systematic review, which again is not conducted by the DRI committee, but is uh, the core uh, of the DRI committee process, and therefore we felt it really important to lay out what we thought were the principles for that type of systematic review. Uh, you have that information in the document you'll be able to download, so just to highlight we are emphasizing the need for well-structured and established protocols, guidance from a technical expert panel, and we talk about the kind of expertise that would be needed, the systematic review to include all study designs uh, initially because the um, possibility of missing something if uh, a priori decisions are made to exclude certain, certain types of studies might limit committees too much, so we're suggesting inclusiveness in the beginning, but then evaluating those study designs and making the recommendations on the best evidence available. Uh, recommending protocols inclusive of the various dietary assessment methods, but consideration of the, um, of the quality of that evidence. And this actually is a recommendation for which there were not options suggested in the report, but the committee felt this was critically important, devoted a whole chapter to it, and devoted recommendation on this issue. Uh, protocols should be inclusive of the health outcomes and surrogates, but with consideration of quality, uh, defensible instruments and analytical methods to assess evidence. And again, this is all laid out in the, um, the grade handbook and then in other types of guidelines, Cochrane guidelines and other reviews that, that talk about how a systematic review is done, um, and a clear presentation of the results from the SR, very well documented so that the committee knows where to start. Um, the other seven guiding principles relate to the actual DRI task of reviewing the totality of evidence. Uh, the first one is about managing conflicts of interest, financial, intellectual, professional, uh, we thought that's very important. The National Academies has a process for managing conflict of interest, uh, and we assume that would be the process that would be used, but we, just, we wanted to emphasize how important that is in these decisions. Uh, expertise of the DRI committee should be broad, and we specify the different types of, um, of uh, 
scientists that should be on the committee, including experts in, in methodology and nutrition science and epidemiology and so forth. Uh, that the evidence review be comprehensive and anticipate the types of scientific issues that will that the DRI committee might need to consider. Uh, completeness, clarity, and transparency. You know, that's, you know, repeat that a lot because that's really critical. Uh, importance of peer review, which is a part of the uh, National Academy's process. Uh, and if there are discrepancies in the evidence that the committee has to wrestle with, to really try to reconcile those, explain them on the basis of study quality or the study approach, and document uh, how that was reconciled or put the guidance out there so the committee can consider it. And then finally, the description of the scientific uncertainties um, that were encountered in developing the report should be, uh, should be there. So um, I want to thank the staff, acknowledging the staff who have been um, just wonderful and so helpful in guiding us through this study. It was a study completed within one year, which is, um, I don't know if it's a record, but it was certainly a fast-paced uh, effort. Uh, I didn't say at the outset that one of the things that was really um, helpful to the committee was that three of the committee members were also members of the Options Report Committee. And uh, Joe Rodericks, who's here uh, with us today to, to answer questions, and uh, Janet King, who's uh, on the phone answering questions, and, and uh, Ross Prentice, were three overlapping members that facilitated our understanding of the options report and how to interpret what the intentions were there. Uh, so I'll close there, and we'll open this for questions. So um, this is Dana again. As Dr. Kulanika said, we'll now open it up for questions. Um, please identify yourself and your organization when asking a question. Um, so I'd like to start off with a question about, you know, why is this issue important and why is it only being looked at now? So uh, this is Mary in Newhouser. This issue is important because uh, chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases make up most of the health problems in the United States today. Chronic diseases include diabetes, mellitus, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, and similar diseases. Uh, while these chronic diseases have many uh, risk factors, nutrition is one of the risk factors, and so providing guidance and information about nutrients that may prevent those diseases is very important. And on the question of uh, why is it being looked at only now, it's not being looked at only now. This issue has been around for some time. Uh, the research community has been looking at the effects of food substances and nutrients on chronic disease for some time. There have been previous attempts to use some of that evidence to develop DRIs, but what the government sponsors of this study now were asking for is a more systematic and complete approach to using that evidence. So that's what they asked our committee to look at. How do we now, what is the best way to use the evidence, what are the best methods to take that evidence on the very important relationships between some food substances and nutrients and some chronic diseases and turn that into usable DRIs. So that, that's, it's not new, but uh, we, we think, we hope we have elevated this now to a new level uh, for future use. Thank you for that. Um, also, how do DRIs differ from the dietary guidelines? Um, maybe uh, Dr. Janet King, who's with mm -hmm. us on the phone, can answer that question. Uh, yes, I would be glad to do that, um, as I've served on both dietary guideline committees and DRI committees. Uh, dietary guidelines focus on recommendations for diet patterns or food intake to reduce the risk of chronic disease and also to achieve a healthy nutritional intake. Uh, once in a while, a dietary guideline committee will address a specific nutrient, 
but they generally do it not in a quantitative way. For example, they may say there is a relationship between calcium intake and bone disease or sodium intake and hypertension, but they don't make that uh, statement uh, quantitative. What we are proposing to do with the DRIs for chronic disease is to look at the same relationships between a nutrient now, not a food or a diet pattern, but a nutrient and the risk for chronic disease. And we also in intend to make it quantitative in a way that has not been done in the past by the Dietary Guidelines Committee. So it will provide better guidance for the public as well as nutritionists and others using the DRIs in knowing how to make recommendations to the public for reducing the risk of chronic disease as it pertains to particular nutrients in their diet. Thank you for that. Um, next question is, how does this report relate to dietary supplements? Um, so this is uh, Shariki Kumanyika again. I'll, I'll answer that. Um, so this report does not relate to any particular nutrient or, or dietary component, but it, it does give guidance to committees of how to consider evidence from studies that might have assessed um, dietary intake that includes supplements, um, food fortified foods, or um, foods with where the nutrient of interest is naturally occurring in a in a mix with um, other sub, other dietary types of, of substances uh, that would be of that need to be sort of isolated from the one that we're interested in. The complexities of doing that with the kind of data we have are considerable. So as I think I, I said during the presentation, so if a supplement is, uh, only contains a particular nutrient, that's more direct evidence. On the other hand, you know, about that nutrient, on the other hand, if the chemical form of that, sub, that uh, supplement is thought to be different in terms of bioavailability or other factors uh, compared to food, then the committee would, would look at that evidence separately and draw the conclusions based on um, the overall nature of the evidence for that nutrient. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Kelly Rawlings. Um, Kelly asks, when you speak about chronic disease risk, are you speaking in relation to all levels of prevention or management, primary, secondary, tertiary? Um, I think that when we're speaking about chronic diseases, we're talking about that definition of the apparently healthy population, and we're talking about a process that would yield ranges that policymakers could use to provide advice for various types of interventions, public health or, or clinical interventions. So I hope that answers your question. Not, the DRI committee itself is not going to make direct recommendations for different levels of prevention or, or uh, clinical assessments, for example, but the information could be used in a variety of ways. And if I might add to that, um, the, the DRIs for chronic disease will not relate to medical management of a disease, so this is at a population level, not, not medical management. Yeah, important clarification, right? Thanks. Um, next question is uh, two parts from Courtney Pauli-Celli. I hope I said that right. Um, is the committee recommending that we have DRI ranges for all age groups, including pregnant or lactating moms and young children? To what extent would this impact the nutrition guidance delivered through the dietary guidelines and my plate? Second part of that is if we report, this is also from Courtney, if we report DRI in ranges, how will this impact the information on the nutrition fact label? Um, micronutrients, for example, micronutrients are usually expressed in absolute amounts and percentages of DRIs. I can uh, take a stab at that. This is Joe uh, Rodericks. Uh, the, 
one key element of the process we described is that uh, we have information from certain studied populations that would be the basis for deriving a chronic disease-related DRI. Uh, we recommend very careful consideration of any populations different in significant ways from the studied population. We, we do not recommend extrapolation, if you like, from the nature, from studied populations to quite different populations. So we would not recommend if we had, for example, no information uh, regarding the effects in children, we would not recommend uh, moving from studied adult populations to children. Uh, so that's, we're very careful about that. We don't want unintended consequences with these recommendations. So uh, it depends on what the information is, what the study population is and its characteristics. That decision then flows from uh, that first uh, set of evidence to what populations with, to which these would apply. Uh, on the question of how this might affect labeling, I think that's beyond uh, anything the committee looked at. Uh, our charge was to look at how we would express reduced risk ranges of intake that would reduce risk of chronic disease. Uh, and that's where the report ends, getting to that point. There are many possible uses for those, that kind of information, one of which would, I suppose, suppose could affect labeling. But that's not something we looked at at all. That's, that's a separate uh, decision that would have to be handled by the agencies in charge of that kind of issue. Um, right. Uh, and this is Shariki. I would, I would like to, to add, because um, it, it needs to be remembered that the traditional DRIs relate to essential nutrients, and committees need to make a decision and give, give advice to policymakers, um, even in the absence of the full data picture. And with the chronic disease DRIs, they're not required where you don't have enough evidence because you're not dealing with essential nutrients. You're trying to give advice to further um, support health. So I think that's something to remember as a difference. Uh, I think the other thing about our report is that we, we talk about a lot of systematic um, evidence review and systematic approaches to looking at the totality of the evidence. But there's always going to be judgment involved. So our recommendations are just that. They're recommendations to DRI committees. They are meant to be uh, to stand up over time in the sense that if new evidence emerges, then committees can, can would still have guidance about how to use that new evidence. And so it's not a prescription that removes the need for judgment of the actual DRI committees. It's really more of a, of a methodological guideline for how to approach it and document it so that you make the best judgment with what you have at hand. Thank you. Um, next question is from Tim. Oh, I, think, I oh, think I heard. Go uh, ahead, uh, Dr. King. Do you want to make a comment, too? Yes, I was just going to respond to Courtney's questions about are we going to have DRI ranges for all age groups? Uh, no, the traditional DRI for specific nutrients will continue to be a single number for all different age groups and populations. We are suggesting that a range can be used for the DRI for chronic disease, and those recommendations will be for specific populations for which there is sufficient evidence to create that DRI for chronic disease. And at this point in time, I think it's highly unlikely that we'll have enough evidence to do so for children and pregnant and lactating women, but as the research advances, that may become something that is done in the future. Thank you. Our next question is from Tim Mork. What will the process be for evaluating which diseases are to be considered for nutritional relationships? Is there a current list of chronic diseases? Uh, well, I, the, um, if you remember the slide about the process that, is, um, that we use, some of those initial decisions are made by the federal agencies. 
They are not made by the DRI committees. Um, the systematic review uh, posed specific questions about uh, associations of, of nutrients or, or food substances to diseases. So our report uh, talked about how to assess the outcomes that are considered important and um, you know the different approaches to doing that. But in terms of the problem formulation about the outcomes, um, I think that's probably not in the purview of the DRI committees. And um, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Kathy Weimer. How will we evaluate prevalence of inadequacy in the population if there are multiple DRI values for one nutrient? So it's well, not inadequacy. Inadequacy. Well, that would the, the traditional DRIs is that not correct? Right. Yeah. Would yes, it's the retained. traditional. Yeah. The traditional DRIs would be retained, both for inadequacy and for excess yeah. as well. Right. Uh, so that will continue. That process will continue. We're talking here about the possibility that there are intakes, let's say between. Uh, the RDA and the UL in that range, which can have an effect on the risk of chronic disease. And that's the focus of our report here. So that's a different question than the inadequacy question, if I understand your question. And I, I understand that that's, that can be confusing because we went through this kind of, kind of quickly, but this is really a different purpose for a DRI, and it's not replacing the initial process. And, that, and, and the recommendations about the integration at the end where it says that same parent committee should be looking at how you integrate what we have now uh, and, and the usual uh, traditional DRIs with this new type of DRI, and that's exactly why one committee should do it, because they're related, but they're not the same. And uh, you, you couldn't, even if you have two, process, two different processes for developing them, you know, they will be integrated into one overall set of decisions. Thank you. Next question is from Peter Liu with Abbott Laboratories. His question is, by incorporating the methodologies discussed here into the future DRI process, would we anticipate future DRI tables be expanded to include chronic disease states or a new set of tables? I don't think this committee considered, no, considered we that issue. No, we, did, we didn't <laughs> consider this issue. <laughs> I, I think that may depend on what evidence emerges yeah. and what yeah. future committees consider in terms of uh, the causal relationship, the intake response, and other aspects of the process that are emphasized in the report and the presentation. Um, we also got a question related to international use of the DRIs. So um, are these DRIs going to be used by other countries? Um, well, I think the question for this report is, is will our process that we have recommended inform the development of dietary and nutrition guidelines in other countries? Um, there are several mechanisms for the different bodies that make dietary uh, guidelines and nutrient guidelines to talk to each other. I mean, Canada was involved in this with the U.S., um, but uh, just globally through World Health Organization and Food and Agricultural Organization, the people who do this kind of work talk to each other, and hopefully that our principles are, are generalizable as a process to other to processes that would take place in other countries. But that's um, that's the hope for the process, and uh, we don't really have any control over that. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, what are the next steps in developing DRIs based on chronic disease? Uh, Janet, do you want to answer that? 
Okay. Well, as, as we move forward, uh, the National Academy of Medicine will be putting together uh, committees to address DRIs for specific nutrients. Um, sodium may be the next one that they undertake. And when that committee is put together, um, they will be asked to take the information from our report and to evaluate whether or not there is a relationship between the nutrient they're considering and the risk for a chronic disease or maybe several chronic diseases. And if so, then they would need to address that. Also, uh, there would need to be a systematic review of that relationship done before that committee is appointed and before they begin determining the relationship between the intake for a specific nutrient and risk for a chronic disease. So there needs to be an evidence um, by the group that's putting together the plans for the next uh, DRIs to do that systematic review first if they think there is a relationship that needs to be addressed. Um, it looks like those are all the questions we have time for today. Once you exit this webinar, you'll be redirected to our report page at www.nationalacademies.org forward slash DRI chronic disease. The slides from today's webinar will be posted on the report page later this week, and a recording of this webinar will also be available on that page next week. And with that, I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us today and discussing their report with us. And thank you all again for participating.